Although he didn't realize it at the time, it was on the Galapagos that Darwin made some of his most profound discoveries. It struck him that many of the birds and the animals on those islands were so different from those on the South American mainland. Yet, there were also important similarities. It was here that Darwin collected a number of finches, but the significance of these seemingly unexceptional birds would only become apparent some time later. The expedition continued onward, past Australia and Africa, eventually circumnavigating the entire globe. As Darwin's journey progressed, he put together the most extraordinary and comprehensive collection of diverse specimens from right across the world that any scientist had ever had at their disposal. Charles Darwin returned home in 1836 with masses of plant and animal specimens. He began to ponder his results. Why do the finches all have different beaks? The answer to this question was about to change our view of life itself. Charles Darwin survived the long journey, circumnavigating the entire globe. He returned home with a rich array of specimens, and ideas started forming in his mind. <laughs> Following his return to England, Charles Darwin pondered whether or not to get married. He made a list of pros and cons, and decided that a wife was better than keeping a dog. He married his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, with whom he would eventually have ten children, and in 1839 they came to live here at Down House in the depths of rural Kent. Supported by a private income, Darwin was free to spend his days studying his vast collection of specimens. But after the excitement of the voyage, Darwin suffered a major personality change from the young, gregarious party-goer. He became a sickly, reserved recluse. His health began to deteriorate, quite possibly as a result of tropical disease, although it may simply have been psychological. Gradually, he settled into a daily routine, cultivating plants and studying every morning before walking along what he called his thinking path along which he would mull his ideas. And as he mulled, his thoughts turned to the small collection of birds he had made whilst on the Galapagos Islands. At first, Darwin had no idea that the various birds he had collected were all of the same species. But on closer inspection, he realised they were all finches. Darwin collected 13 different types of finches on the Galapagos Islands and what puzzled him was the different shapes of their beaks. The beaks varied depending on which island they had come from. On one island they were short and fat for cracking nuts while on another small and thin for trapping insects. Yet on another island they were thin and sharp for sucking blood. This set Darwin thinking. What had caused this difference? He remembered Lyle's intriguing theory that the world had changed a great deal over time and it occurred to him that perhaps living things were somehow gradually adapting to fit in with this slowly changing environment. He concluded the finches must all be derived from a common ancestor and each of them had somehow adapted to suit the available food source. And so it struck him. If variation can take place in finches, then why can't variation take place across the entire realm of organic life? The idea was a bombshell, suggesting a whole new way of viewing life on Earth. Darwin was convinced he was right, but the trouble was, he knew that somehow he would have to prove it. But Darwin wasn't the only person looking for a coherent explanation for the development of organic life. In 1844, an outrageous and best-selling book came out. Written by an Edinburgh publisher, Robert Chambers, it was called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, and it suggested all living creatures had descended from earlier forms. But it received a slaughtering from the scientific reviewers. 
It was called sloppy, ill-contrived, lacking in evidence, and utterly speculative. And it taught Charles Darwin an important lesson. Before he published his theory of evolution, he would have a solid, sound, and utterly watertight argument to back it up. He began to look at the embryos of animals, noting that they go through stages resembling the adult forms of more primitive creatures. Reptile, bird, and mammal embryos all look similar in the early stages of development. Not only that, but some animals had the remains of limbs no longer used, such as snakes with the remnants of legs. During the Victorian era, many new fossil findings were being made, confirming the idea that the Earth had changed greatly over millions of years. This led Darwin to search for further evidence in what we now know as the fossil record. Welcome to the laboratory. I'm now going to look at what Charles Darwin called the origin of the fossil record and make what might be called an evolution pie. Now at the bottom of all the rock strata are the earliest volcanic rocks that contain no fossils whatsoever. Then after the volcanic strata, the oldest forms of living things that we find on Earth, the remnants of the ancient jungles. Then on top of the vegetation are the first primitive shell creatures that lived in the oceans of the world. Then after the shells come the first creatures capable of moving on their own. In now go the fishes. After the fishes, we come to those creatures that develop little legs that enable them to claw their way up the beaches, the primitive lizards. Get in the geological measure. Come on. Once they'd started to live on the face of the earth, you might say they came to realize that they liked it and produced giant lizards, what came to be called the dinosaurs. And now we're into the last 65 million years. And in that period, evolution took off like wildfire populating the earth with all the species we know today. On the top of the tree were the monkeys and the apes. Then, simply add hundreds and thousands of years. And finally, we get to mankind. Come on, in you go. And that is the fossil record. <laughs>